record this lecture and I'm going to share the screen. We're going to start a new chapter. I think I mentioned this a few times. I'm going to repeat it one more time. Oh, okay, hold on. I I have two screens today, so I'm just gonna get rid of one of them. I don't like that. Share the screen. Okay. I do have a question actually. Yes. When I was I was going through the homework, what makes you go? I'm gonna split this up in the YJ components instead of going straight for IC. Okay, you have seen IC is easier, right? Yes. So I suggest you to practice both, right? For example, the problems that are from the IC section, you can do IC section, right? Mm -hmm. The problems that are from other part, you can do IJK to just practice. In the exam, I may ask you, ask you to do IC only, right? or relative velocity only because I want to test to see who knows how much, right? But overall, it doesn't matter. If the problem doesn't tell you, you must use relative motion or IC, you pick the one that is easier. Just remember, IC only works for velocity, right? Mm -hmm. If the problem involves acceleration after finding you know, velocities and omegas, which you can do with IC, you're going to go back to the analysis, do IJKs, cross products, expand them, and do it that way. So technically, if the acceleration is involved, even if you use IC, you have to still use IJK vector analysis, right? So, but if the problem, the, the, the bottom line is if the problem doesn't tell you which way, it might be easier to do IC for velocity and it's fine. Right? So um, when we started this course like a six, seven weeks ago, six weeks ago, I guess, or whatever, um, I told you that we have particles and rigid bodies, right? We did kinematics of particles. Then we did kinetics of particles through three chapters. One was Newton's second law. One was work energy. One was impulse momentum. We're gonna do exact same steps here for rigid bodies. So for the rigid bodies, we already did kinematics. So I'm gonna ask you, what was the main difference between particle and rigid body when it comes to kinematics? What was the main thing that we didn't have in chapter 12 and we have it in chapter 16? And who can answer that? If someone asks you, okay, chapter 12 is kinematics, chapter 16 is kinematics, what is the major difference between a particle and a rigid body when you analyze it? How are you going to answer that? Who They're is going to part of the system? What? They're part of a system. Well, particles could be part of a system. But remember, Anytime we analyze a rigid body, which is part of system, still we analyze the rigid body, right? It's rotation, it's general motion and whatever. It's still the individual element or rigid body that we analyze, okay? Of course, for mechanisms, we use more rigid body, but there's a fundamental difference between particle and rigid body. Have you noticed that? I'm sure you noticed, you may not know which part you should focus. I'm gonna give you a hint. For particles, we assume they're like a point element, right? Even if it's a car or airplane or a boat or a soccer ball you kick, we analyze it as a single point moving in space. For rigid body, we assume it has dimension and dimension brought rotation. We did not have rotation for particles, right? 
it was all one point moving around. If it's a car, you drive a car 400 miles, you really don't care if it turns left and right a little bit. The path of the car is like a point. It's like you have your, I don't know, pencil on a map, the way you drive and you draw the path of driving is just technically a single point when you look at big picture, right? But for rigid bodies, we had the rotational motion. It wasn't just, if this is a rigid body, it wasn't just translation. We had rotation. So rotation added omega, added alpha, and added angular displacement, that all of that contribute to the kinematics of the rigid body. That was the main difference, right? Particles, sometimes you may go back to chapter 12, 13, 14, it says neglect the size of the thing. When it says neglect the size, that means it's like a point because if the size matters, then you have to consider rotation, right? But if it's a single point, then you neglect the size. That's what it says. So why I brought up this? Because now that we go to the kinematics, we're gonna do the same thing. This chapter, we will do kinematics of rigid bodies using Newton's second law. As you will see, the major difference between this chapter and chapter 13 is the fact that you have to consider the rotation of, rotational motion of the rigid body. So with that introduction, we're gonna to go to see what we learn here. First, because rigid body has a distributed mass over the space, is a rod, it's a sphere, it's a cylinder or disc or any shape. We, we kind of review briefly center of mass and moment of inertia. And this is mass moment of inertia. Then we're gonna to go to equations of motion. You remember for the kinematics, we had three types of motion, right? Pure translation or just translation, rotational motion and general motion, which is a combination of translation and rotation, right? Three. Now that you analyze the Newton's second law, we analyze the same kinematics with forces and everything. So first we talk about translation, then we talk about rotation and then general motion. One extra thing, the friction for rigid bodies, when you have a rolling object like a tire, a wheel, um, I don't know, a, a, a soccer ball or basketball or something with, you know, rolling, the friction is a little bit tricky. And we get to that point and you see what it means. So when we analyze friction for rigid bodies, specifically if it's a rolling element, it's a little tricky, so we're gonna discover that. So this is what we're gonna learn here. With that kind of introduction, let's go back to the whole idea of what we're gonna learn here. When we talk about the rigid body, you remember we had translation, translation, and then we had rotation. So rigid body could have both of them, either of them, you know, a combination. Now, for translation, we have displacement, which gives you S, S dot, S double dot, you know, velocity acceleration. For rotation, you have theta, angular position, theta dot, theta double dot, which kind of gives you angular velocity, angular acceleration. So we talked about this before, that there's an analogy between linear displacement and angular displacement, linear velocity, angular velocity, and acceleration, right? Now the question is, when we have, for the translation, when you have F equals MA, right? For rigid body, this is Newton's second law, right? What is the equivalent of that for rotational motion? So up to here, and you may remember from beginning of chapter 16, when you have translation only, you can treat your rigid body like a single point because everything moves together, right? The question is if rotation comes to play, what we're gonna replace or what we're gonna have for angular motion? 
let's just, I mean, it's not a right expression, but let's call it like angular force. We have like linear force and angular force. So with analogy between linear and angular, you have S theta, S dot theta dot, S double dot, theta double dot. Now, F equals MA, I wanna see what we should put here, right? So this is what we're going to discover. And when we do this, you can solve problems. Any questions so far? It's good. So to be able to answer that, first we talk about center of mass. I think all of you have passed statics to be here, right? No one has skipped the static because is it? So we talked about center of mass in a status. I'm not going to go through all details and many examples. Just remember, if you have tiny particles, this is how you define center of mass. Summation of mi ri's as a vector when you add them, and this is going to be an overall vector, it should be equal to mrg, and g represents center of mass, right? And interestingly, because this vector analysis exists, when you take the derivatives, same goes with velocities. And when you take the second derivatives, same goes with acceleration. So technically, G is a point that if you consider the whole thing as a single point, it can represent the entire rigid body. This is for system of particles. Most rigid bodies are not particles side by side, is a continuum system, right? So for that, instead of summation, you're gonna use integral and that's what you're gonna get. So this is the definition of center of mass. I'm sure most of you wouldn't remember all details. We're gonna do a simple example to kind of remind you. If you need more practice, you can go back to your statics note and uh, do that, okay? And then we also talked about mass moment of inertia. If we consider theta and theta dot and double dot as angular position, displacement velocity, and what I'm gonna say is not technically right in terms of technical word, but again, just analogy, mass moment of inertia could be considered like angular mass, which means is the inertia for angular motion. Let's just call it angular mass, angular inertia, right? How we calculate that, if you have a tiny particles, overall moment of inertia about an axis is gonna be R square times that mass and you add over the entire system. Do you guys remember this? Remember, we also have area moment of inertia, which is R square dA. That's different story. This is mass moment of inertia. So this should be dM, okay? If your system has homogeneous material, that means the material is uniformly distributed, instead of dM, you can write rho dV, right, because rho is constant through the entire system, comes out of integral, and you can calculate it like this. Now, if you go to your textbook, let me just grab the textbook. I suppose some of you may have your textbook with you, right? If you go to the last page, actually the, the hard copy ends, there's this uh, diagrams that shows the center of mass for regular you know, shapes like a sphere, half a sphere, I don't know, cylinder, plates, rings, and stuff like that. And it shows the moment of inertia about different axes. Remember, center of mass is a single point. And it doesn't matter where you put your X and Y, it's gonna be the same point, but moment of inertia depends on axis of rotation. So if this is Z, this is gonna be I about Z. You can also have I about X. Let me just go to the 
tablet so I can show this to you. So if this is your rigid body, let me just put it more in the middle. This is your rigid body, right? You have Z axis. You have X axis and I try to kind of do it like 3D and Let's just use another color. And then you have Y axis. Okay, so technically, this is X, this is Y, and this is Z. If you, if you consider this tiny element and you measure the distance from Z, the moment of inertia is going to be integration of R, Z, dm, or again, if dm, you can write it rho, dv, right? And if rho is constant for a homogeneous material, rho, Rz square, dv. If I measure this distance from y axis, then it's going to be iy, which is integration of ry square dm over the entire mass, over the entire volume. And if I measure this distance from z, right? the distance of that particle from Z axis, then you're gonna get I, Z, I, sorry, about X. Then you're gonna get M, R, X square, DM, right? So that's how you're gonna have three moment of inertia about each rot potential rotation axis. So if you, do you guys have your textbook with you? Anyone has textbook with you? Go and open the textbook and look at the back of the, the, the last page, like it's in the, the last, last page. And you will see it gives you, technically it gives you I, X, X, because it's about X, Y, Y, and Z, Z. So you get three moment of inertia for objects that are symmetric like a sphere, I, X, X, and Y, Y, and Z, Z are going to be the same because, you know, sphere is symmetric. For something like a disk, I, X, X, and Y, Y are the same. Z is different and stuff like that. Okay? And remember, if this is my rigid body, okay, I have the same rigid body. I just move the axis of rotation, which means... Let me grab this stuff. Okay. And let's say I move my axis of rotation and put it here. Okay. Then for the same stuff that I had, I had your RZ, RY, and Rx will change. So for this new location, these are not going to be the same. Change will change. If XYZ coordinate system move, go to somewhere else, right? Unlike center of mass, which is, you know, 
independent of how you pick your XYZ system, for moment of inertia, that depends on where your axis is. Is that clear? So, okay, now let's go back to the, the slides. So, this is the equation you have for simple, or I wouldn't say simple, for some of the standard geometries, you can calculate this. I suppose even you're in your calculus, you have done some of these integrations, right? In your math one or calc one, you have done some of these integrals, so that should be routine. The good point is, most of the objects we use are standard shapes like a rod, a rectangular plate, a sphere, a cylinder. So for those, center of mass and moment of inertia is given in the back of your book. Now, this is something important. For some reason, many students, when I say many, not like 70, 80%, but maybe 20, 30%, good number of students, kind of confuse this. As I told you, the moment of inertia depends on where your axis is, right? If you shift your axis somewhere else, the axis of rotation, the moment of inertia will change. How you can calculate moment of inertia, if you have it for one axis and you shift your axis, how you can calculate that, this is how you do it. If you have your moment of inertia, about the axis that goes through G, center of mass, right? And now you wanna have your moment of inertia about another axis, like this is X prime, Z prime, Y prime going through G, but your axis of rotation is here. How you can find I about this Z? So I about this Z is I about G, plus mass times d squared. What is the, the distance between z and z prime? Right? So if you have a sphere from your table in the book, you can find i about its center. If that the sphere rotates about another point, you don't have to do all the integrals. You can simply use this equation to get your i about the new axis. Does that make sense? Right? I think this was also in your statics, right? Because all these things were discussed. There are some examples in chapter 17 at the beginning. I may put one of them as your homework, I may, or I may remove it because now we have reduced number of problems, right? I don't want to waste one of them for this. But if you need practice to find center of mass or um, moment of inertia, please take a couple of those examples and solve them. If you need help, obviously, as always, you can ask me. One more thing. If you look at the back of the book, again, for cylinder, for a ring, for a disc, for a plate, for a, I don't know, like a rod, for a sphere, for these standard shapes, you have moment of inertia that you can technically integrate and find it if the material is homogeneous, right? But not every object we do or we deal with in dynamics has a standard shapes. Give me an object that is not one of this regular, you know, kind of classic geometrical shape. Give me something. A lamp from the 70s. What? A lamp from the 70s. A lamp from the 70s, something that rotates. Oh. Yeah. Because, you know, we are talking about dynamics of rigid bodies. It should move, rotate, translate, or something like that. There's something called bicycle. I'm not sure how many of you have seen that bicycle, oh. right? You all know what bicycle is, right? You all have had it. I had it one, right? Is the tire of the white bicycle a standard geometrical shape, like a disc or a sphere or something? 
Is it is it the standard shape? I thought it was. N not really. If you simplify it, it's like a ring, but practically it's not a ring. Like the tire of your car. Let me go back to the um the tablet and tell you what I mean because uh, I may not be explaining that properly. By the way, when we talk about the ring, right? A ring, let's say this is a ring, right? If you cut the cross section, it has a circular shape, but goes all the way around that, right? If you have a close look at your, the tire of your bike, it doesn't have the circular shape. The, the tire looks like something like this right and then the uh the wheel is like that the tire comes here and then you have those things right this is how it looks like right if you want a bigger example the tire of your car the tire of your car is usually something like this right it goes like that and i'm going to draw half of it right and then the tire sits here. By no means, this is not a, a standard geometrical shape, right? The sprocket of your tire, your, your, your bicycle, or if you have a gear system or like a pulley, you know, belt and pulley. Belts usually have a cross section like this. The, sorry, the pulleys, right? So this is where your belt is going to sit. Then it comes something like that, becomes a little thinner, comes in the middle. Then you have where your bearings sits, right? And then this continues. Something like this, right? This is how a pulley is going to look like, and this is the axis of rotation. Is this a standard shape? Is this a sphere, disc, cylinder, any of those? No. So for cases like this, you can still integrate those mass. You can still, let's say this is a Z axis. You can still find IZZ by integration of R square dm. I'm sure the 3D modeling softwares can calculate this for you, but one way that, or you can calculate this experimentally, okay? For some reason, instead of giving this number, sometimes it's easier to give your I as a dimension square times mass, right? Remember, I, is integration of R squared dm. So if you have a ring, the entire mass has a radius of R, right? You guys follow? For a ring which has doesn't have really dimension, when you calculate I, IZZ is- I don't think we can see the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. You guys should have told me before. This is because sometimes this screen share kind of dies. Hold on. Or maybe I'm getting too old. I thought I'm sharing the screen. Now I see why Aaron was smiling, right, Aaron? <laughs> you should have told me. Okay. So. Let's go back. You didn't see anything from the ring, right? From the beginning? Yes? Okay. Okay, let's do it again. If you have a ring, and I do the cross section, right? This is like your DM, right? So the entire mass is concentrated on one point. So when you do integration of 
r square dm literally everything has the same distance so it's going to be m r square for this on a sphere and stuff like that you get the same but as i said now let's go back hold on nothing works today i was explaining if you have the tire of your bicycle the tire of your bicycle has this metal part these tiny rods and then the rubber tire this is not a standard geometrical shape right or if you make it bigger the tire of your car right if you feel this this is the metal part and then this is the rubber part again not a standard geometrical shape same thing with the pulley that carries some belt right this is your pulley not a standard geometrical shape and many others gears and some others in cases like this you can find you can still find your izz using this equation or experimentally right you can find the value for some reason instead of giving you the i as a number they use a dimension like a length squared times m and they call that guy as radius of gyration what it means is this you have the whole tire of your car with this crazy shape but you assume if this was a simple ring, the entire mass goes on a ring, how much this radius should be to give you the same moment of inertia. Does that make sense? So instead of telling you the moment of inertia, and by the way, let me ask you this, what is the unit for the moment of inertia? How, Jen, what is the unit for moment of inertia? Uh, okay, Andrew, you tell me. Can you say that again? You're kind of cutting off there. The, the unit for moment of inertia, I wrote it here. It be meters per second. Meters per second. This is for velocity, right? Moment of inertia is not velocity. How you guys find the unit if you forget it? You look at the equation that it defines it, right? This is your equation. What you have here, r square, r is the distance, right? and dm is mass so it should be kilo kilogram meter square or kilogram millimeter square or slug feet square or slug inches square so it's like mass times distance square now if you buy a gear the company doesn't tell you I is this much, for example, kilogram meter square for some reason. They tell you the radius of gyration is this much millimeter. How you can find I from radius of gyration? This is the equation. Technically, I is radius of gyration squared times M. So it gives you the mass. It gives you the radius of gyration. You can calculate I. 
It's just another way of explaining how much I is. Does that make sense? So for some objects that are not standard in the industry and also in your textbook, it may gives you it may give you radius of gyration. is for example, let's say, I don't know, 150 millimeter. This means I is 0.150 squared times the mass and you find I, that's it. No trick in it or no nothing. It's like indirect way of telling you how much I is. Does that make sense? And it usually goes with objects that are not standard. As I said, like gears, tires, some crazy shapes that you, it's not a sphere, cylinder, rod, something. Any question about this? Okay, let's go back to the slides. Now, this is the explanation. In some cases, when the shape is complicated, you cannot calculate the, uh, as I said, the moment of inertia by integration, or it might be very difficult. They may have experimental ways of calculating or determining the I. And then instead of giving you the value of I, they give you radius of gyration. And from radius of gyration, you can simply calculate I. Any question? Okay. Now we're going to do some examples. You get used to calculating I and everything, but this is just a basic. Just to refresh your memory, I'm going to do a simple example to calculate G. Here, you have a pendulum made of a rod. It says a, a slender rod, but it's, it's very thin, the diameter is negligible. It's technically like a line mass. And you have a plate here. The problem asks you the G for the entire object, finding where the G is, and also calculate the moment of inertia of the entire pendulum about the axis that passes through G. So while you're taking the notes, I'm going to just draw this. So you have a plate and you have a rod their center of mass and moment of inertia and everything. You should be able to get it from the back of the book. For the rest, we can calculate it here. Okay. So the rod has a mass of three kilogram. The plate, which is thin, so you neglect the thickness, has a mass of five kilogram. Let me go to the uh, tablet. So let's call this rod and let's call this as plate, right? So the mass of rod is three kilograms. Mass of plate 
is five kilogram. These dimensions, as you can see, this is one meter, this is 0.5 meter, and this height is two meter. The G for the entire system is gonna be somewhere like here. I don't know where, but somewhere in the middle, right? This is G. I wanna find this Y bar, the distance of G from that top point. And also the moment of inertia of the system. But then, now, first for y bar. If you go back to that equation we had in the first slide, we said m r g is equal to summation of m i r i. You guys see that this is a symmetric geometry. So J is not gonna be, G is not gonna be here or here or here, right? Has to be go through this, uh, the axis of or center of symmetry. Does that make sense? So for that reason, instead of finding X and Y and Z, I simply need to simplify this as M Y G, which we call it here y bar is equal to summation of m i y i. So we have two objects. So m y bar is m plate y plate plus m rod y rod. This is the equation you have, right? Now, where is the center of mass for a rod? You have a slender rod. Where is the center of mass? You can look at the book, but I think you should know it. Chris? The center? That's the center, right? Because it's that's also symmetric. So this is like G rod. If the whole thing is two meter, Y rod, is one meter. Where is the center of mass for the plate? Again, it's symmetric. So this is gonna be G for plate at its center. From the top, if you measure this length, how much is Y plate? Hmm? Hi Z, how much is Y P? I say, I, I think it's 2.25. 2.25, 2 uh, 2 because th this is two and this is half of it. So it's gonna be 2.25. I'm just gonna substitute the values. The mass of the whole system is gonna be three plus five times Y bar equals plate is five times 225 plus three times one. And from here, you can find your Y bar as, someone gives me the number. Got 1.78. 1. 1.78, 1. the unit? Meters? Meters, because the other length are in meter, right? So that was easy. Now here's the question. What happens if the rod, if you had another object that was here? 
kind of above this reference line, would that Y becomes positive or negative? Negative. Negative, because remember, this is a vector analysis, so the signs matter. If it's the other side of your reference line, this is your reference line, right? If the other side is negative, it's this side is positive. So for this case, both are the same direction, so we're good. Now, the next step, is it okay if I erase this few lines? I mean, you can see it later in the video anyway. So if you're done with this. The next step is to find the moment of inertia about Z axis. And remember Z axis coming out of the plate of your, you know, plane of your paper or this tablet. So to find I about G, I have two objects. I can separate them and add I for each of them together. So it's going to be I of plate for G plus I of rod for G, right? You guys follow? Okay. Now, I of plate about G, how much is it? If you take, if you look at the back of your book, it gives you, remember, Please pay attention for a second here. We have I of G about its own center of mass in the textbook, right? You can look at it. Now we want to find I of G about this point. So we have this distance of D. So technically I of G about, sorry, I of plate about G, it's going to be, I of plate about G of plate plus, now we use parallel axis theorem, M D squared. Which M? M of plate, which D? This is D for plate, right? And we're gonna do the same thing for the rod. I of rod about G, is equal to I of rod about its own G plus M D square, which M, M of rod, which R, R of rod, and this should be P. And this distance, is D of rod, the distance of, center of mass from the center of rotation. Any question about this part? You guys get it, right? Okay. Now, I'm gonna go I of P about G of P. If you go to the back of the book, and I hope you all have your textbook with you, I don't know if it's visible, but uh, it's hard to show it. Okay. I'm just going to write it down. I of G about center of mass, I of plate, is going to be 1 12th M A square plus B square, where this is A. This is A. And this is B. Okay. One side is A. It doesn't matter which one is A or B because it's symmetric A or B square. So you're going to get the mass, which was 5, 12.5 square plus 1 square. So this is going to be I about center of mass. And someone gives me this number.
How much did the guys get? It's uh, 0.52. How much? 0 0.52. 0 0.52, the unit? I'm saying it's a uh, kilogram, meter square. Meter square. Did everyone get the same number? Right, okay. So if that's the case, then this guy is going to be 0.52 plus five times dp squared. How much is this dp? This is your dp. How much is this guy? Remember? YP this, minus Y bar. YP minus Y bar. Yes, YP minus Y bar, which is going to be, I'm going to write it here. DP, which is YP minus Y bar, is going to be 225 minus 1.87, right? And it's going to be point. Three eight meter, right? So you're gonna put I five. Think, Sorry. Um, I think the y bar was one point seven eight. Oh, seven eight. Okay. Sorry. Then this guy is gonna be point um four seven right meter so we're going to put point four seven square and ipg will be how much come on guys I see some of you don't even try to use your calculator. I got you... one. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. How much? I'm sorry. I got um 1.62. Kilogram meter square. Now we're going to do the same thing for the second one, right? For the rod, I of rod about its own center of mass. If you look at this table, it is going to be m l squared divided by 12, right? And I'm just going to, I'm not going to write the whole thing. So here you're going to get m l squared by 12. Let's just put the numbers. 3 times 2 squared divided by 12 plus three times dr, which is going to be this part, sorry, this part, which is 0 0.78. And you calculate this. And if you add these two values together, this one and this one, you're going to get your ig. And your final ig, should be 4.45 kilogram meter square. You can make this calculation, add it to this and see what you get.
And I hope we calculated everything right. You should get this number. Okay. So that is how you calculate or find center of mass and you calculate moment of inertia about center of mass because that's what we're going to need. Remember, this center of mass thing, we just don't need it for chapter 17. When we go to chapter 18 and 19, we still need this moment of inertia and stuff like that. So all the kinetic parts, you have to do these calculations quite frequently. Okay. Now let's go back to the slides again. Now we're gonna do the equations of motion. We kind of learn how to calculate center of mass and moment of inertia, kind of a reminder or review. So if you want to find equations of motion, here's the thing. Imagine this is your rigid body, right? You have different forces acting on the rigid body. You have a center of mass, so we you put gravity on the center of mass. You have external forces, external moments. The object could have an omega and alpha, same direction, opposite direction, doesn't matter. So this is like a very general case of a rigid body. Imagine you throw a potato in the air or something like that with some forces acting on it, this kind of like that. For some reason, all these shapes remind me of potato. Now, for translation, you can write summation of forces is MAG. All the forces acting here, center of mass and its acceleration. So that's kind of easy. It's almost like a particle. Okay. Now, for rotation, There is derivation to find this. I'm not going to go through derivation, but this is what it is. And let me tell you what this equation is about. Remember, when you talk about moments, moments should be about a point, right? If I put my reference point on point P, like M1 and N2 create moments already, F1, F2, F3, F4, all of them create moments. Remember, this is a vector analysis goes in X and Y. Moments, this is a planar motion. So all the moments are in Z direction. The same way we had a uh, right hand rule. I don't know if you can see my hand. If this is the planar motion, right? Uh, it's hard to show. If, if, if this is planar motion, all rotations are in the plane. So omegas, alphas, and moments are perpendicular using your right-hand rule. They're going to be in Z direction. So technically, every equation here, every term here is in Z direction. So we don't write it. This is the equation you get. There is derivation in the textbook. I'm not going to go through the derivation. What is Y bar and X bar? Y bar and X bar are the x, y position of g in this coordinate system. So let me write it down again in the tablet. To show you what is what. If this is your rigid body, right? You have a reference point to measure the moments. Let's say that is my reference point P. If I put my coordinate system, 
right on P. So this is like X and this is Y. Your center of mass is somewhere like here. Let's say like here. The position of center of mass from this XY coordinate system, this is X bar, this is Y bar, right? And those are the location of, so if that's the case, you can write, summation of moments about P is equal to minus Y bar M, and this is the mass of the whole scene. The X component of acceleration of P plus X bar M, the Y component of acceleration of P plus moment of inertia about P times angular acceleration. This is the equation you can write. If you know the point P, it could have an acceleration, for example, I don't know, like in this direction, let's say this is like AP, right? Then this is gonna be APX, this is going to be APY, and those are the terms that come here. As I said, there is a derivation to do this, but we're not going to go through that derivation because it's just like you know a couple of pages of writing. At the end of the day, we need this equation to solve problems, so we just stick with that one. Okay. Now, you can also write this equation in terms of acceleration of point G. So everything is the same. Summation of moments about P, it's gonna be minus Y bar M, now you use acceleration of G. When you derive this equation, you can drive it this way or that way. Plus X bar M A G Y plus I G alpha. You can write the summation of moments and related to acceleration, linear angular acceleration using one of these two equations. Remember, if you use acceleration P, I is also about P. If you use acceleration G, I is also about G. But summation of moments is still about P. Looks a little confusing. That's okay, we're gonna simplify this, okay? And we go from there. Any question about this? You just need to understand what each term means right? Like here, X bar and Y bar are this length and this length. AP and YP are the components of acceleration. Let's say for this case, let's say like this is acceleration of G. I don't know, G goes this way, oops. Let's say, for example, G has an acceleration like this. And then you get it X and Y component of acceleration and you put it here. Okay.
And this is what you have here. This actually, this equation is a little bit, I'm gonna say ugly, right? It has a lot of terms. The point P is an arbitrary point that you have some information about, so you can pick it that point, or you can point G, which is always a point of interest. The question is, can I simplify this? In general case, this is what it is, but we have some special cases that this becomes simplified. And please pay attention here. Do not write for a couple of minutes. Let me ask you this question. What happens if point P is on G? I want to pick a point to get the moments, right? Instead of pointing an arbitrary point, I'm going to pick the point G. If the point P and G coincide, what happens to this equation? AP becomes AG, IP becomes IG, and MP becomes MG. What else? Hmm? What else? What happens to Y bar and X bar? You remember, Y bar and X bar was this the X and Y distance between G and P, right? You guys follow? We go to zero. It's going to be zero, right? If Y bar and X bar is you get it of these two terms, so this simply becomes summation of moments about G is IG alpha. Much easier, right? Much simpler to deal with. I think you like this better, right? Kelly? Much nicer to have. Another special case. A lot of times we have rotation about fixed point, right? So what if the point P is a fixed point? Look at this top equation and tell me what happens to it. Which terms will vanish? Hi, Z. If point P is a fixed point, or maybe with a, po a point without acceleration, what happens to this equation? Which of these terms could vanish? I think the, the last term. This term will vanish? Yes. Okay. We're going to keep it that way. I'm going to ask Yi Yang. What is your opinion? Do you agree, Haizi? The, the same as his. Hmm? The same as his. The IP, IP. This is going to vanish, the last term? Yeah. You guys support each other, huh? Okay. I like that. But it's not correct. So I'm going to ask... Um, I'm going to ask Jake B. Jake. Jake, do you hear us? Some of you guys even don't listen, I guess, right? How about Jake Z? Um, I'm not quite sure. Okay. I'm going to go to the majority now. Kelly, if P is a fixed point, which terms will vanish here? Um, will the APs vanish because it's not like moving? Yes, if P is a fixed point, how much is ac its acceleration? Zero, right? So you get it of these two terms. So the second case, if the reference point is fixed or literally has no acceleration, let's call it for as a fixed point, we usually call it O. So if this is the case, 
APX and APY will be zero. And if you call it O, summation of moments about O is IO alpha. So this kind of ugly big equation will simplify for rotation about fixed point. And if you pick your reference point on G, so it's not as bad, right? That's how you analyze if there is a motion like the one we described. So now, now that we develop this moment and acceleration relation, we're going to go back to equations of motion, right? For pure translation, summation of forces, for example, if you use XYZ or normal tangential, or remember when it was pure translation, you could treat it like a particle, right? So you can use XY, NT, or R theta for linear acceleration, but because there's no rotation, look at here. If there's no rotation, alpha will be zero, right? So it's, if alpha is zero, you get summation of moments about G zero. These are the equations you have for pure translation. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's do this example. In this example, you have this like a parallelogram mechanism, rod AB and CD have the same length. You neglect the, their masses. So it's like very small and thin. They don't we technically neglect the kinetics of AB and CD. And this horizontal bar, which is uniform, has a mass of 20 kilogram. There's a rope fixing point D here, right? Now, if I cut this cord and there's a horizontal force, imagine when this cord exists, does this thing move? No, because if it wants to move, it has to stretch the cord. So when the cord is still safe and sound, this doesn't move. As soon as you cut this, this guy starts moving. And you want to find immediately after cutting this, we want to see how much force are created in the link A, B, and C, D. So you guys draw these things. And just to see what kind of motion this has, if you look at the bar BD, what kind of motion it has? I'm going to ask uh, Yun. Yun, what kind of motion this bar has? Rotation, translation, general motion. Come on. Does it rotate at all? Anyone else has any comment, recommendation or suggestion? Translation. Why? Because it's moving side to side. Because it's like a parallel. I don't know if you can see this pencil. Because it's parallelogram, it's not going to go like that. It's going to go like this, right? So it stays parallel all the time and just translates. Okay. So if that's the case, we're going to analyze and see how these things move.
I'm going to draw this mechanism here on the tablet and we're going to see how it moves. Remember, link AB and CD could have mass and contribute to the forces and everything. But to, this, to, to simplify this case, problem says neglect their masses. So we make, we, we're going to consider this as massless. How do we solve this problem? Any recommendation how to start? I want to see if you guys remember what we did in chapter 13. When we had Newton's second law, what was the first step? You guys remember? Free body diagram. Exactly, free body diagram. For which part? For the link BD, the, the, the rod or the bar, whatever they name it. Okay. If that's the case, let me draw this. This is link BD. The forces that we have, we're gonna have the force P here. We're gonna have gravity, of course, center of mass is in the middle, right? Because it's uniform. You're gonna have mg. Then you will have the force of AB like here. And the force of link CD. Do these two forces are identical? The green AB and CD forces? Are they identical or they're different? They're different. Why? Because the rope between those two. No, no, no. Listen, the rope, you see the rope was here. We're going to cut it. So technically, we start analyzing this. That's a good observation. In a statics, there must be different. But when you cut the rope, and I'm not gonna say they are identical, they could be different, right? So we assume they are different <laughs> because there are cases that there are different. In this case, you will see they're identical, but there are cases that they could be different. Now, this is the case. I'm gonna write my equations of motion. Summation of forces in one direction, Mag in that direction, summation of forces in another direction, Mag in another direction. I didn't say which direction I'm going to ask you. And then summation of moments about G equals Ig alpha, which is zero here. Because alpha is zero, right? Now the question is, what coordinate system I should pick to solve this problem? Horizontal because you already know the value of P. The coordinate system is not horizontal. Coordinate system means X, Y, N, T, R, theta, right? X, Y. X, Y. Do you guys agree with him? Kelly, you agree with him. So we get 51% plus Aaron. So this majority. Yeah, but you know what? We do the democracy, except my vote has a higher weight. And I disagree with you guys. You guys tell me why. I'm gonna disagree. So 
which means x y is not the right coordinate system to pick here or not the best coordinate system to pick here now i want you to analyze it and tell me why is that because p is tangential to the path of motion and mg is normal to the path of motion you kind of get to the something neither of them are the way you said wow ah. but what kind of motion the bar has translation what kind of translation linear rotational you know kind of curvilinear rectilinear what kind of motion i mean when you dangle a bar it's going to have some type of rotation to it it does not rotate i mean rotation is not a right word here's the thing let me ask you this what kind of motion point b has This be the linear translation. B has a linear translation. Yeah. B is attached to link AB and AB is hinged here. Is it linear or circular? It'd be circular. Technically, B rotates about A like that, right? How about D? same thing with c exactly so c take these technically rotates about that which means the two end of this rod have circular motion right which means the rod itself has circular motion which means the point g that is in the middle right that also has a circular motion. Now, if a point has circular motion, what kind of coordinate system we're gonna use for it? Polar. You can do polar, yeah? Or you can do anti. Technically for circular, they're identical, right? They get the same thing. If I do NT, normal tangential, now that we know they're circular, oops, let me grab these things and remove it from here. Does it also have something to do with the equations we already have for acceleration of the normal and tangential components? I didn't get your question. Is, it, is the reason why it's going towards normal tangential is because we have acceleration broken down to normal tangential tangential components exactly you see part consider the g consider you guys please listen here carefully consider the center of mass as a particle like chapter 12 right that particle has a circular motion so for the circular motion it's good to use normal tangential right because it moves on the circle the radius is constant you can use that one make sense so that's how we now because the acceleration is good to do with the normal tangential we're going to do the um newton second law divided into normal oops and tangential okay could you use x and y yes but then you had to consider the tangential component of acceleration divided to x and y, consider the normal component of acceleration divided to x and y, that's kind of complicated. If that's the case, remember, if for the B, this is the radius of rotation, look at here, please, for a second. If this is the radius of rotation for B, it looks like G rotates about, it's not attached, but if I do it, it's kind of the same thing, right? It's like a parallelogram. So technically, this is going to be your t direction. This is going to be your n direction. So if that's the case, I'm going to draw those directions on my rigid body because a rigid body is not complete unless you get your coordinate system. Right? 
Now I'm going to divide the forces in n and t direction, rewrite equation one, two, and three. I'm going to give you one minute to write equation one and two. And please, everybody try this. You may have to erase it if it's wrong after I'm doing, but that's okay. And remember this angle, let's call it theta, which is 45. These are the two equations, right? If you write it down. M is given as 20 kilogram. And P is given as how much? 50 Newton. This length is 0.6 meter, so LBD is 0.6 meter. These are the values we have. Now, if we look at these equations, how many unknowns we have here? How many unknowns? Apparently, if A, B, we don't know it. Oops. If C, D, we do not know it. The angular, the, the tangential acceleration, I'm going to write it, you know what, it's easier to write it as A, T. So I'm just going to write it tangential acceleration. I don't know this guy. How about V? The velocity of G. This is R for G, obviously. Do I know velocity of G when I release this? When I cut the cord? Chris, do I know the velocity of G? No. No, so we have four unknowns, only two equations. Of course, I can use this equation two. Let's just write equation three. So remember, P passes through G and MG passes through G. None of them create moment about G. If you go to FAB, 
it has the horizontal and vertical component. And if you go to CD, it has horizontal and vertical component. Again, the horizontal components go through G so they don't create any moment. Only the vertical creates moment. So if that's the case for equation three, you're gonna get FAB, the vertical component is gonna be sine 45 times the distance from here. This is like 0.3 times 0.3, it creates a moment this way, and this component creates moment opposite way. So minus FCD sine 45 times 0.3, and this should be zero. Equation number three. We still have four unknowns, so we need one more. From here, you can simplify, say, FAB is equal to FCD. And that's what we thought from the beginning. We were not sure, but the equation proves it. So never assume things are equal un unless, you know, you, you get the proof. I still have need more more equation about V. What do we know about V? And I'm gonna ask, um, who should I ask? You. I think, is it you or you? How you, I don't know how you pronounce your name. You. Mr. Yang, is it you? Yeah, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce your name maybe properly. How you pronounce your name? Let me, I don't know how I can I, unmute you. Hmm. Difficult. Okay, anyway, let me ask someone else. What do we know about V? Look at the problem, the definition of problem. The problem is like this. You have this bar sitting there because of the cord, right? It's not moving. Is it right, Kelly? Now, I cut the cord. Right after I cut the cord, how much is the velocity of the, the, the bar? Immediately after cutting the cord, has the bar started moving already? The answer is no, right? When you cut the cord, it starts moving, but its initial velocity is how much? Zero. Right, guys? Because when you cut it, it has some acceleration. It has not started the, mo the motion. So if that's the case, I'm going to go V is zero. So your normal acceleration is zero. Life becomes simpler. I'm going to rewrite equation one and two again. One becomes P cosine 45 minus mg sine 45. AB and CD are the same plus two FAB equals zero. Equation two P sine 45 plus mg cosine 45 equals m a g t, the tangential acceleration. From one, you can calculate f a b. I'm not gonna go through the details. You have the numbers. If a b is gonna be 51.7 Newton, and from two, you're gonna get a g t, as 8.7 meter per square second. So that is how you solve the problem.
Okay. So we started with free body diagram. Remember, when we deal with rigid body, you have to understand if the rigid body has translation, rotation, or general motion. That's one thing, right? The second thing is to find out which coordinate system is suitable to use, specifically if it's only translation, right? Then when you do the free body diagram, you get your equations settled, established, and get all the forces into directions, you solve the problem. With this example from now, you should remember, if something starts moving, okay? If it starts moving, the velocity at the beginning is zero. There is acceleration that causes the motion, but right at zero, time equals zero, no velocity. Right? Any question about this? Can you do something like this in a quiz or final exam or whatever? Let's go and do another problem. This is another problem, kind of similar, but not identical. It says at the instant shown, the link CD has an initial omega. So the initial velocities are not zero, right? And you apply a moment of 650 pound feet to the same link. It's still like a parallelogram. So as this move, this, plate or whatever they call it is not going to rotate. Therefore, the box on the top is not going to rotate. It will have translational motion, but still, again, look at my hands. If this is the mechanism and it goes like that, this is going to stay parallel. So it kind of moves like this, right? It has a circular motion, but no translation. Does that make sense? The box and the plate below this move like this. Similar to what we had before. Now, all the dimensions are given, the distance between these two, the center of mass. I mean, I don't like this schematic because look at here, A to C is three feet. G to D is one feet. So technically this part should be two feet. So they didn't do it the scale. Okay. So my point is this is not in the middle when you get the things done. And you need to write the equations and solve it. The uh, they create the whole thing weigh 150 pounds and fully secure to platform. That means they're not gonna slide or you know tilt or whatever, they just move together. And the problem asked to find the forces developed in link, the force developed in link AB and angular acceleration of the links at this moment. Okay. I'm gonna give you a minute to write down or take the kind of schematic stuff. So the platform and the box or crate move together.
How do we solve this problem? Any suggestion for a starting point? So the weight is 150 pounds. Let's write that down. I put all the dimensions here. Now you remember you have a torque or moment applied to link CD. So then the two links may not have the same forces, okay? And let's switch to the tablet. So this is how the system looks like, right? You have the platform and you have the, the crate or the box or whatever you name it. And that's how it goes. Now you guys tell me what is the starting point? I know we are almost done with the time. I just want to give you some thought process. So next time we're going to finish this, okay? What is the starting point? Kelly. Uh, free body diagram. Free body diagram for which rigid body? Is it for like the box, the crate? The, the crate, the, the platform? But remember, we have some stuff here, right? I think we need to do the free body diagram for all of them, right? So what I'm gonna do is this. Let's say this is the crate with the platform, right? Then I have, if I do the free body diagram, let's just do the stuff first. Then I have, Oops. Then I have link CD and link AB. Okay. This is CD and this is AB. For CD, we're going to have a torque this way for a moment, right? Then we're going to have reaction forces here, like CY and CX. Then we have CX and CY here. For AB, you're going to get AY and AX and then A. Uh, Let's just call it B. You know what, this is B and C, we just keep it separate. And then we have BX and BY. If you go to the crate, the reaction of these forces will act on the crate. So you're gonna have like BX, and dy, here you have bx and by, and of course you have mg. So we're gonna have these three, let me just separate them a little bit.
Okay. So we need to have these three separate stuff. If we neglect the mass of A, B, and C, D, which means summation of forces will be zero because there's no M A, right? There's no M. So for, and they have rotation about fixed point. So technically, if there's no mass, A, B, and C, D are like a static problem, right? Which means summation of forces in X equals zero, summation of forces in Y equals zero, and summation of moments about one point, for example, C equals zero, or summation of moments for A equals zero. These are like the equation, you know what, just to separate them. This is for C and for AB, summation of forces in X zero, summation of forces in Y zero, and summation of moments about A zero. This is for CD, this is for AB. Right? Can I do that? Yes or no? If there's no mass, when you say MA, there's no M, so it's going to be zero, right? Looks good. I'm going to keep it here. Next time we come back, and next time is going to be Friday, we're going to continue, finish this. And we're going to go to the next top topic, okay? Something I want you guys to do. If you want to understand this well, try to solve this problem yourself. Also, if I do the free body diagram for the crate, of course, for the crate, I'm going to get summation of forces in. Again, this has a circular motion for G. So it's going to be N. M A G N summation of forces in T M A G T and summation of moments about G equals zero. This is for crate plus platform. Right? And we go from there. Is it too much? If you want to understand this well, I suggest you to try to solve it before Friday. I was going to give you as a bonus homework, but I think we need more practice. So I suggest you to try it when we do it on Friday. If you already practice with these things, it will stick to your head much easier and faster. Okay? Any question? Okay. So thank you very much. I will see you on Friday. A reminder that you can still do your homework. Okay. And finish it and you have question, let me know. If anyone has homework questions, you can stay right now and ask me like an office hour. If there's no other question, I can stop it here. Anyone wants to stay? Let me stop the recording.